This Filmmaker IQ lesson is proudly sponsored by Rode Microphones. Premium microphones and audio accessories for studio, live, and location recording. Hi, John Hess from FilmmakerIQ.com, and today we're going to look at the science and technology of digital sensors. Now, before we get into the quantum mechanics of digital sensors, let's look at one of the crowning achievements of 19th century chemistry photographic film, which in many ways is actually an analog to the processes underlying digital. A film at its most basic is a thin sheet of cellulose or plastic covered with a very thin coating of silver halide crystals suspended in a purified gelatin. When the shutter is released, the film is exposed to light. Now those silver halide crystals begin to break down. Photons, the quanta packets of energy that make up light, strike and get absorbed by the atoms in a silver halide crystal. This, in this case, silver bromide. This extra energy causes the bond between the silver and the bromide to break, resulting in a free electron, a positively charged silver ion, and a bromine atom. This free electron migrates in the crystal toward the portion of the crystal called the sensitivity spec a shallow electron trap that is either a deformity or a piece of silver sulfide or gold added to the crystal in the manufacturing process. Now the sensitivity spec, the electron bonds with a positively charged silver ion to produce a free silver atom. The more intense the light hitting the crystal grain, the more free silver atoms are created. Now this quantum dance occurs on every single piece of grain in the exposed film. But after the initial exposure, the silver atoms on the grains are still far too small to see. Now this latent image needs to be developed. Amazingly, you only need four silver atoms arranged on the molecule in the crystal to make a crystal developable. Using further baths and chemical processes, the tiny invisible silver specks are amplified, often billions of times, creating a negative image that we can reverse and create a positive print. As silver halide is the key chemical that makes film possible, silicon is what makes digital possible. A silicon is a semiconductor, meaning it doesn't conduct electricity as well as a metal, but it conducts better than insulators. This is because silicon has four electrons in its outer or valence shell. Now this causes silicon to create tetrahedral crystals with other silicon atoms where each atom is satisfied with eight electrons in its outer shell. Since the outer shell is now full, there are only a few free electrons floating in the crystal lattice. It can conduct a little bit of electricity, but not too easily. But if we inject a small amount of a different element, we can create different kinds of conductivity in the silicon crystal, a process called doping. Add a small amount of phosphorus, which has five electrons in its valence shell, and we create an N-type semiconductor. Phosphorus fits in the tetrahedral crystal, but it has one extra electron. Contrarily, if we add an element that with only three electrons in its outer shell, say boron, we create a P-type semiconductor. The missing electron creates what's called a hole, a space that attracts a free electron. Though P-type and N-type carry positively charged holes and negatively charged electrons respectfully, the actual charge of the P and N-type semiconductor by itself are both neutral because there's an equal number of protons and electrons in the semiconductor crystal. Now, when we put a P-type and an N-type semiconductor together, we create one of the most basic but most important electronic components, a PN junction diode. A diode is simply a device which allows current to flow in one direction, but not the other. When a P-type and N-type semiconductor come together, some of the extra electrons from the N-type move in to fill the holes of the P-type, creating a depletion layer. Here, the P-type material with its holes filled in with electrons is now negatively charged, and the N-type material, now missing its extra electrons, is positively charged. So, if we connect the positive terminal of a battery to the P-type side, or anode side, 
and the negative terminal to the n-type side or cathode side, we start to draw electrons out of the holes in the depletion layer, causing this depletion layer to shrink and the current to flow through the diode. This is called forward bias. Reverse the polarity of the battery. So now the battery is adding more electrons to the p-type side, causing depletion layer to increase. The negatively charged p-type area now repels electrons and the current cannot flow through the diode. This is called reverse bias. When a diode is in reverse bias, we can exploit a phenomenon called the photoelectric effect. Just as with silver halide crystals, silicon reacts when struck with photons of a specific energy, wavelengths between 190 and 1100 nanometers, which happens to include visible light. When a photon is absorbed by a silicon crystal, it creates an electron hole pair. The electron will move toward the positively charged n type side of the diode. From here, we can measure the intensity of the light by measuring the number of electrons, or the voltage. So how do we get a bunch of photodiodes to create an image? Well, the most intuitive way is to wire them up in a grid, an XY grid, one photo diode per pixel, then read out the voltage column by column. Well, that's just what RCA tried, but every time the voltage passes a pixel, it picks up a little bit of extra voltage, a problem called capacitive coupling, resulting in a lot of noise and striation in the image. A solution to the problem would be to get rid of the wires entirely in a breakthrough process developed at AT&T Bell Labs by William Boyle and George E. Smith in 1969. The charged coupled device, or CCD, uses no wires. Instead, it uses a single piece of silicon, a large photoelectric diode divided with insulating channel stops. The slab is then coated with a very thin layer of silicon oxide and tiny strips of charged aluminum are laid perpendicular to the channel stop. So each pixel of the sensor is bound on the sides with a channel stop with three aluminum strips running top, middle, and bottom. And here's what happens. Electronic shutter on the camera opens, letting light onto the sensor. The photoelectric effect creates electrons that migrate to the top of the silicon slab, where they are now confined by the channel stops and the charged aluminum strips. The shutter closes, and the sensor holds the charge from the exposure. Now that charge is shifted row by row by alternating the current along those thin aluminum strips and sent off onto a serial shift register, which is then set out to a capacitor connected to an amplifier and recorded onto the camera's memory. Once the entire charge is moved off, the sensor is ready for the next exposure. <laughs> this ingenious bucket brigade system of moving pixels produced clean and relatively noise-free video signal. But with every piece of engineering, there's always a trade-off. Though the image was noise-free, a tiny amount of charge was lost each time the electrons are shifted. Uh, this would become a problem with higher resolutions that required more and more shifting. Also, the readout of a CCD is slow. The information is read in serial, one pixel at a time, during which the electronic shutter has to be closed. And finally, the process of shuttling those electrons requires quite a bit of voltage. Voltage that would quickly drain a battery, say, of a small device. Still, the CCD came to dominate the video market in the 80s and 90s, but an alternative was brewing, and ironically, it would go back to the same XY grid concept that had originally failed because of capacitive coupling. CMOS, or Complementary Metal Oxide Semiconductor, is a technique of constructing integrated circuits such as SRAM, DRAM, and microprocessors. The CMOS sensor, or more accurately the CMOS APS for Active Pixel Sensor, were described in papers at relatively the same time as the invention of the CCD, but CMOS sensors lagged behind because of manufacturing reasons. But as manufacturing processes became more sophisticated, the CMOS APS became commercially viable as a camera sensor in the mid-1990s. Now, much like a CCD, a CMOS sensor is made out of a single slab of silicon. But instead of shuttling electrons row by row, each pixel has a small capacitor and a signal amplifier. Amplifying at the pixel level overcomes the capacitive coupling issue and is what makes the sensor an active pixel sensor as opposed to a 
passive one. This amplified voltage is then sent down tiny wires onto a bus and processed in parallel to be stored on the camera's computer. Now, despite the fact that each pixel has its own capacitor and signal amplifier, CMOS sensors draw much less power because there's no need to shut electrons like in a CCD. Because the voltage data is read in parallel, CMOS sensors are capable of reading the data off the sensor much faster. But one of the drawbacks of the CMOS sensor is higher noise. In CCDs, you only have one amplifier at the end of the imaging process. In a CMOS sensor, each pixel has an amplifier and micro variations can cause noise issues. Also, there is a common motion artifact that plagues practically all CMOS sensors, rolling shutter. In a CCD, images are recorded in a single instant. A CMOS sensor records data line by line, so the information collected at the top of the frame is slightly ahead of time from the information collected at the bottom of the frame. Now, this results in the jello effect, where fast pans look crooked, or strange patterns developing in fast moving objects. Now, rolling shutter isn't always necessarily bad. By reading lines at different times, you can give each pixel a little bit of extra time to capture photons, resulting in better low light performance. A rolling shutter can also be mitigated with really fast readouts or by including a little bit of memory on each pixel that stores the voltage before being read out. Now, despite these limitations, the advantages of the CMOS sensor from its ease of fabrication to low power draw make it ideal for both consumer and professional level cameras. Arthur C. Clarke's third law states, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. When explaining the quantum physics of camera sensors, it feels a lot like I'm describing magic. I mean, photons, electrons, measuring quantum particles smaller than the wavelength of visible light, all done by a species who just a few centuries ago was unaware of microscopic bacteria. And now we're harnessing even more infinitesimally small particles, bending them to our will, storing them up, and then expending them to tell a visual and audio story that changes our experiences, how we think, and how we feel. And that power over nature is practically in reach of every human being on the planet, whether they have a superficial understanding of the mechanism underneath or not. Well, that to me is nothing short of pure magic. We stand on the shoulders of such giants. Use this power you have and go out there and make something great. I'm John Hess. I'll see you at filmmakeriq.com.